it's kind of like if we're talking about the ways that as we will a lot I'm sure over the course of this show but the Lucas and the Charlie similarities here's another similarity is that they're stupid okay so shall we begin let us shall (laughs) <laughs> let us shall here we go hello everybody listeners to another episode of ambition unpacked heck yeah and we did this out of order because it's been we took a little break we broke it up into two episodes but we're supposed to say i'm maggie oh uh, and i'm maddie <laughs> and this is ambition unpacked um we as i said we took a little break because i had some crazy stuff going on last march i was very busy so we broke 105 into two parts and just put off recording 106 a little bit that's partially because our episode for 105 was also really long so um if you guys liked having the shorter episodes let us know we can break it in half more often we're kind of just gonna feel it out see how it goes if you don't say anything we'll just we're just gonna free wheel it so (laughs) yeah if you don't say anything we're just gonna be like five hour episodes here you go (laughs) you have to make yourself known like the um eight hour victorious thing that everybody was watching it's like the eight hour ambition yeah we know some people would be down (laughs) but um i think if it was us we probably well if it's about ambition we probably would be down but eight hours is still a lot It's, it's a bit it's a bit here we are we've made it to the middle of the first season we're already halfway through oh exciting stuff and so we're on episode six which is stripped before we dig into it with something that we are adding again it's kind of funny we're like oh we're gonna not talk about x so we can chop down time and we're gonna not do this and try to <laughs> focus on xyz and then we go let's add this thing so we're it's always gonna be long and i think we have to accept that um but we're going to be adding both of us did if you didn't know there is much like there's a character ranker on the ambition blog there is an episode ranker so you can go and you can methodically be put to the test and have to choose your favorite out of two and it does math and then it gives you your favorite episodes in order so we did that um before we recorded this episode and now we know, and so we're going to kind of, as we go through each episode, be revealing where does this particular episode fit on our ranked list. So we'll be doing that at the epi- at the end of the episode, but I thought first we could very quickly kind of recap and talk about where the last five have fit on our lists. Wonderful. <laughs> I guess we could just go right down the line. So the pilot, 101, where did yours fall? It was actually, like, fairly high, mainly because of, like, the iconery of it. It's the pilot, Um, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so it was number 37, so it's five from the bottom. Right, not Um, too bad. There's 41 total for for everybody to know, so... Um, yeah, mine is also a, a bit high as far as season one episodes go, because I feel like season two and three, like, really pack the front for me. Yeah, um, exactly. There are a couple, though, that break yep. the upper mm-hmm, echelons mm-hmm. of this list from season one. Yeah. But for me, first impressions pilot was number 34. So mm. higher for some season one episodes, but definitely not that high. Yeah, and I will say in advance that I'm not historically that good at ranking things um (laughs) I get a little bit caught up in like little details that's true I feel like we talked about as well that we would at you know as we're revealing these things we might realize like well actually I feel like maybe this should have been higher this should have been lower by the time we get to the end of an episode after rereading it because you do kind of either on the plus side like you remember things that you forgot were in an episode or Mm -hmm. like just the whole vibe of an episode feels stronger than you thought or on the flip side it can be like even if there was this one moment that you just love and think is so great it's like you come back to the end of the episode and you're like well actually maybe the whole thing like wasn't as good as mm-hmm. the heart that I put around x or y moment so <laughs> these are the things that we have put out there through this ranker but we'll see how accurate they actually are as we're talking about all of them episode two I know we both did the same <laughs> we've been pretty open about it's where this number episode's. 41 it's last wah, wah. Wah, wah. 
It's just, it's just simply I mean, a mess. Yeah, so we know why. Listen to the episode about <laughs> Listen it. Listen to the episode where we complain about it. Yeah. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so uh, number episode three, under pressure. For me, that was right under the pilot. It was 34. No, it was 35. Sorry, because 101 is 34. I can't read. It's 35. <laughs> yeah, mine was very similar. It's 34. I think I just ranked that quite highly because of, I don't know, it just it just really has that, the, the duos. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, I, it it's pretty high as far as season one episodes go. At least this, this chunk of first half of season mm-hmm. one episodes, because it, I think it's one of the stronger conceptual episodes of the first six. And it also, yeah. to me, I think we talked about, you know, in an episode, so go listen to it. But it really, you know, like, it really feels like the kickstart of the season. It's like all these things get set yeah. up, dynamics, plot lines, stuff like that, that a little bit of characterization. And so it's like that, it just feels much more stronger. And I think it maybe even gets a boost because of the fact that it comes right off 102, which is such a mess, that it's mm-hmm. like, okay, nice. Like, it has a very good, strong, like, impression in my mind. Yes, exactly. 104, number 38 for me. Uh, 36 for me. I think it's a, it's a nice episode. It's just not like, again, yeah. it's like when, when you love all the other episodes so much more, it's like, you just can't. Sorry. <laughs> Someone has to be at the bottom, unfortunately. Exactly. exactly. So then 105, mm-hmm. when we just finished talking about Extra Extra, for me, that was 38. So it was pretty low. Yeah, mine's number 40. Yeah. Um. Even though, again, like, I really, I do enjoy it. But, you know, there's just a lot more happening later on. And that's not yes. the fault of these episodes. They have to lay the groundwork. Yeah, they I mean, don't get points. So. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. I mean, we talked about in our two, two-part two podcast, you know, we talk about there's lots of stuff to dig into. It's just that everything else that comes after it is just so, it's just better. I mean, <laughs> yeah. to be honest. So, that's kind of where we're, we built up. And now again, we are at 106 stripped and we will save our reveal for where they rank for the end of this discussion. So we'll just, shall we jump right in? Yes. I'm All excited. right. Here we go. So let's do our, our beautiful little stats and our opening things here. So the word count for this episode is 7,743. Which is only a thousand more than 105, which is the shortest episode. So again, we're still pretty low in word count at this point. It's going to get so much crazier. I will tell you right now, and when this episode airs, I think it will still have not premiered. So it's still exciting. But so season four of the premiere, um, I'm two thirds through writing it about. um, And it's already like 35,000 words or something. So... Wow. It's going to be long. <laughs> I well, feel like season four, we just, at this point, it's just going to be long. And that's that. So everybody get okay. excited to I mean, read for a thousand years. All right. So that's our word count. And then the runtime translation is, it, it treats, equates to 45 minutes. Uh, it aired, theoretically, we assume, again, this is still, we don't know exact dates, but starting next episode, 107, we will actually have exact dates and that will be very exciting uh, this one, I think, based on the Google Doc, is May 27th, 2019. So mm-hmm. about 10 days after 105, it seems like there was a bit of a gap there. But, I mean, 107 is May 31st. So it clearly, like, this was a patch where we had a little break and then just really jumped right back into it. So Yeah. And you probably, the... like, Go ahead. were like, oh, I'm not going to post this now because I'm, like, really busy, but it's done. And then you, mm-hmm. like, posted it. And then you already had the next one, like, ready, basically, right away. Yeah, that could be. I mean, or it could have been the same thing, too, of, like, like, I can remember there were sometimes where there were just, like, little gaps, but otherwise it would be, like, I think I sometimes was, like, trying to be, like, I should wait a little bit, and then I'd be, like, no, I don't want to wait, and I'll just post (laughs) it. So the structure that we have now is, again, very helpful. So then for page count, in terms of on the PDF, this is 16 pages, so one, I think one page more than the last few episodes have been. And then this oh, yeah. episode has eight songs total. Which is decent. It's one per two pages. So. Yeah, it's about, I think the kind of final, by the time we get to season three, the kind of amount of songs we have is really kind of like 
range is 9 to 11. And if it goes higher than 11, it's like, that's a lot of songs for an episode. And if it's lower, it's like, that's a remarkably low number for an episode. So mm-hmm. eight's not bad for season one. Yeah. Especially such a short episode. Yeah. there's a, It did feel like every time I was turning the page, I was like, oh, it's another song. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so the title, it is stripped. I think I like it. It's not like, again, I like snappy title, so it's great that it's a snappy title, but I like it yeah. because it does have a, a nice dual meaning where mm-hmm. it, the music, you know, it's reflecting what the concept of the episode is going to be, which is acoustics, but it also, I think I like it because it, it kind of is reflecting when, you, we'll get into this whole thing, but it reflects the theme of the episode in terms of like the way people are socially i think there's a big theme of isolation in this episode and i will Mm. unpack that but um i I think that the title kind of reflects that as well like it's you're stripped away like you you're down to the bare essentials and are you are you alone or are you you know still connected with people when you're down to your essence that is Mm. the title um i can't even remember how we picked that title I think it literally was just because we were like, acoustic? What's like another word for acoustic? And so that's what we went with. It was not a very deep discussion. Uh, But the screen cap for this episode is Zay. (laughs) I'm pretty sure at the time this was like the only photo I could find of a mirror that was like, looked like at all, like in a production, like in a movie or a TV show. Aside Mm -hmm. from like being from Girl Meets World, which I didn't really didn't want to do. Partially because... Zay in that show is wearing flannel all the damn time. And I'm like, Zay Babineau would not be wearing flannel. (laughs) So it's just like not really usable. But yeah, so it's like a nice little close up of his face. Like he's talking to people. looks great. Um, But the main reason that we picked it for this episode is because this episode, to me, really feels like the first Zay episode that there is. It's the first time that we're Mm -hmm. really getting a sense of his true emotional Mm -hmm baggage whereas before she's been like that's the really cool guy who's nice and talented which is true Mm -hmm. but aside from the like dyslexia angle that we look at in 103 this is the first episode where it's like this is his episode in a way like if we were doing if ambition was structured like um say skins or whatever like this would be the zay episode you know Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i haven't seen skins but sure (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I know other shows do that too. I just can't think of like what when each episode is like based around a person. Similar to how Scam does each season based around a character, like that idea. Yeah, that's really like adjusted me to only focusing on one character, which <laughs> isn't actually the case in most shows. In most shows, yeah, and especially not in Ambition where we have like a no. thousand characters at once. <laughs> Honestly, it's better. This is better. Because I love all my blobbers. So true. So true. So then the synopsis here, I can bring it up. It says, nothing but the beat. In Lucas's Mm. absence, Sean and Angela give the techies a break by declaring all numbers acoustic for the duration of the week. Sparkle can't get a grip on the assignment. Zay fights a creeping sense of isolation. Aw, sounds like it's such a sad time. Isn't it always? Um, I mean, yeah. I think it's really funny that even just from the synopsis, it makes it sound like it's like, well, Lucas isn't here, so you all are incompetent, and we're like canceling school. It's kind of what it sounds yeah. like. Um, which like, is he like, does nothing, but also if he's not here, we can't do anything. Yeah, everything falls apart. Um, yeah, so that I just think that's really funny, but that is kind of like literally what happens in the episode. But I think there is some interesting things, you know, Farkle and Zay being the two that are mentioned. Um, Mm. Some kind of big ticket thoughts there Mm. um, that we will dig into as we go through the episode. But I think it is it is quite reasonable that they are the two that are mentioned. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it starts with Farkle singing. It starts with Farkle and it's going to end with Farkle. Dun, 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 dun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we can jump right into the episode then. Uh, and basically, we jump right in with this performance, as mentioned, which is putting on the Ritz from Young Frankenstein. And I want to know, where did we get this show? Because I personally had never heard of it before <laughs> this. Yeah, um, so this show, the reason I know about it is because my sister, she went on a trip to New York with our theater class 
um, which like we, they did every year and like you could go or not go. It was like optional. I only went once and the time I went was like really terrible, but we don't have to get into that. The show I saw though when I was there was Newsies, so that's really fun. Um, but she saw two shows when she was there. She saw uh, Curtains, which is how I know about Curtains, which is my second like either first or second favorite musical of all time it competes with uh into the woods but that's how i learned about that and that's also how i learned about this show young frankenstein because that was the other show that she saw and the thing about my sister who i love is that she when she like gets into a musical or gets into an album like she listens to it non-stop so it would be like even if i didn't want to listen to these soundtracks i would be listening to them because she'd be with her phone like carrying it around the house and you're just listening to it over and over and over again so that is how i was exposed to these two musicals but i i really enjoy young frankenstein and i love curtains so it's kind of like it worked out pretty it well out. <laughs> right exactly but that's how i was exposed to it but the show is basically i think it came out like i guess like mid 2000s it's got to be mid 2000s or like late 2000s unless it was a revival but i don't think it was but it's a mel brooks show so it's if you know mel brooks like he is all about like satirical comedy and so this show is kind of just like honestly like a silly kind of stupid take on the story of frankenstein and so that's why it's like if you listen to the whole show or you look up the show it's Basically, you got Frankenstein and he wants to make the monster because he feels this, like, pressure from his family. Like, there's a song called Join the Family Business, which is where all the ghosts of his past, like, they come and they're like, you need to join the family business and, like, make a monster because your ancestor from 18-whatever. I don't even know when this show takes place, to be honest. Um, But he's not, like, the original (laughs) Frankenstein. He's, like, a young Frankenstein. He's, like, a next generation. And he, like... I could be wrong about all this, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, Cause I've never actually seen it. I just know it from my sister. Oh, I haven't seen it. Um, so people can fact check this and be like, Maggie, you're wrong. But, um, but basically like he is like in this long line of Frankenstein's who have made a monster. Right. And so then he like Igor, the character of Igor, like he comes in and he's like, you know, it's like our family tradition to like work together to like make a monster that terrorizes everybody. This town has been terrorized by us for, you know, a million years or whatever. And, so it's, like, this very silly, like, okay, I guess I gotta make a monster. And that's, like, the kind of premise of the show. And then shenanigans. But this song, the context of what's happening in the show is that they're trying to introduce his monster to high society. And be like, look, the monster's not scary. Like, the monster's fine. And so, like, they basically are, like, putting on the ritz. Like, they're being, like, fancy and, like, showing, like, it can sing. Like... It can dance, like, look at it. Um, But so the characters that you have here in the show are Frankenstein, who is, uh, who Farkle is singing as, and then Igor, and then there's this girl, I don't even remember her name, she's, but she's basically, like, the love interest to Frankenstein, she's, like, a farm girl who helps them. I think her name's Inga, but, so that's the the Maya role um, here, and Zay is doing the Igor, and then... Which, to be clear, like, in this, it's not, they're not doing it in the context of the show. Like, they're just doing this number. So it's not like Zay has to, like, literally be Igor. But um, he took his lines, essentially. Uh, And then the monster is, if you listen to the song, of course, there's, like, this person who does not quite sound right when they're singing. That's supposed to be the monster. And I always thought, I don't think this is in here, but I wrote it up to myself to mention it, that I always imagined that Yogi was being the monster. um, Because I think Mm -hmm. he'd have fun being silly so he would and you know vocalizing vamping a little bit you know very fun yes so that's kind of like the grand context of the the existence of this number and how i knew about it to put it in this i have just googled it and it is based on mel brooks 1974 comedy horror yes yes i forgot it's based on a movie yeah yeah i mean fascinating stuff Mm -hmm. we love to see it this is a musical (laughs) adaptation of a of a comedy horror who wouldn't yes i mean this is kind of like this podcast is going to become especially as we get further into episodes like a a half musical podcast with someone who loves musicals Mm -hmm. and someone maddie who doesn't really know much about many musicals (laughs) and me musical splaining but what i wanted to say about that with this performance is the musical haters can shut up (laughs) because this song is iconic and it's so fun and the reason that i like it a lot is because it does have this, like, I like the way it builds, 
where you start with just like this very kind of fun like vampy chill song like we're so cute Mm -hmm. and we're singing and then it becomes like it builds and builds and builds and it becomes this huge dance break with this like you know the the jazz music and like it's just very over the top and I love that so people can hate but I think it's a great opening to an episode wow who is hating so rude Okay, you know who's Probably, hating. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. Like I've I've hated on some of the things, but I'm I my mind is open. <laughs> this is catchy, catchy musical theater tune. Yes, it is fun. I think also like putting on the Ritz like is an actual song. Like it's it was something that was kind of like adapted into this musical. It exists on its own. I think it's like a jazz number. I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, so I think it's not. It's like it is a song, but it's also like a musical theater song because they reinterpreted it for this. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I just I love, I love dance, big dance numbers, and that definitely is what is going on in Ambition here. Is it like a big dance number with a lot of technical effects in the background um and I wanted to say you know uh great first of all to have a diva trio little opening I love the diva trio and I love when they sing and perform together so love that and I just want to say with the tap dancing I want to see Zay and Charlie tap dancing I want to see them killing the fuck out of this number and everybody else kind of killing the fuck out of this number but not being on their level I wish we could see it Mm -hmm. we can't that's okay it's not okay but no. I wish we could see it. And um, yeah, so that's kind of like the front facing part of this opening section here. Yeah. And then we get to the tense. <laughs> the tension. And we're upset. Yes. What I like about the fact that as we, we move from the front where we're seeing all the dancing and all that stuff, we see the behind the scenes about like, how are they pulling this off? How are the techies going through this especially because Lucas is not here since he was suspended last episode after the fight and what I really Mm -hmm. like about this sequence both because it's still to the jazz music so it's like very exciting and sounds really cool but I like that it shows that like the techies it's not like one of them is just replaceable you know like they need the full team to function properly and it's like no one person is disposable And I like that it shows that, especially this early on. I like that it shows that with Lucas because you get the impression in those first few episodes that Lucas, like, does nothing and is nothing and is just there to be grumpy. But the way that they're Mm -hmm. struggling here really shows you, like, no, like, he does have very much of a purpose at Adam's. Yeah. Love that. It's so cute. Just the fact that they all need him and respect him and, like, see him as their leader. Like, Mm -hmm. Lucas... (laughs) he wouldn't believe you but that's okay yeah i and then i think it's funny that you know like jade has to help and she's like i don't know what i'm doing like i'm a costumer i'm not supposed to be back here uh of course there's the beautiful moment of asher characteristically passing out because he's overwhelmed and dylan just managing to catch him dasher there you go that's them yeah they are And then we have Nate and Dave trying to move this very large set piece during this and everything has gone wrong. So it doesn't work. And Dave in his part one of his battle with curtains at this school um, trips and sends the whole thing on top of him. And so everybody freaks out and that kind of ends the number. Dave said, I do not agree. And I will (laughs) be. This this is wrong. It's wrong. But I wanted to say the way they react. um, Angela, once, once they've like, had a moment to breathe Angela asks Davis you're not injured are you and he gives a little thumbs up like he's good he must be like indestructible I have to say and um she says oh good because our insurance definitely would have covered that maybe not the thing to be prioritizing but that's okay yeah Um, Angela (laughs) is she the best teacher well eh. but I like this moment because small super small detail but this is the first I'm pretty sure the first moment where we learned that Dave's name is actually Davis because she calls yeah. him Davis there. Um, I think there's sometimes times where people are still like, oh, his name's Davis? And I'm like, yes, his full name is Davis Blitz Williams. Whoa. What a name. Is there any significance of that? or I just thought it would be a cooler name. Like, I feel like he needed a name that was not, like, as basic as David. Like, something that was slightly yeah. different. 
just because he's yeah. Dave and he's slightly different. <laughs> um, but also because I think I like to, now that we've gotten into season three, you know, there's this whole plot with Lucas and UC Davis, which is a school. Oh, um, oh but that's I, fun. I do love that little like connection there of like, oh, Dave is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So we jump into, after that, beautiful opening. Yeah. It goes, cute title sequence. Yeah. And then we go to Angela and Sean discussing, okay, what the hell are we going to do this week? Because this is insane. And, you know, the techies cannot keep up with this. So Angela kind of is like, well, I don't get what the big problem is. Like, why are they sucking so much right now? <laughs> um, and I highlighted this line here um, in my pink for foreshadowing, where Sean says, I know he doesn't come off this way, but Lucas is more of a leader than you'd expect. Mm. That's partially just because if that's true in this episode, and he's explaining like, no, like, he actually needs to be here. I'm not surprised this is happening. But I highlighted that as foreshadowing because, spoiler, as we know, in season three, he goes on to become class president, school president. So he really is lucas is more of a leader than one would expect mm-hmm. especially at this point that is great foreshadowing um and also i like this also a little bit of foreshadowing here it's not a shock to me that the train is sliding off the track without that and angela asks even with isadora and i feel like that's almost like a change to come you know like mm-hmm. do you know what i mean it's sort of like if we're really reading into that like even with Isadora what about even without Isadora like mm-hmm. yeah huh? yeah I think that this whole this whole plot in this episode is a little bit of a kind of thematic foreshadow to what we're going to deal with in season two mm. where we kind of lose both of those heads and so the techie monster is running around without it, with his head cut off um and mm-hmm. like he says here like the train sliding off the track like, that's kind of a perfect way to sum up season 2A. Like, the first half of the season is the train is sliding off the track. <laughs> yeah. For many people, not just the techies, but definitely for the techies. They're just very visibly sliding off the track yes. at this point. <laughs> so then Angela and Sean come to this conclusion to help the techies that... Well, Angela, she doesn't say what the idea is, but she says she has an idea. So we know that they're going to do something about the situation. We go into the cafeteria for lunch, and we have this scene here where it's Zay, Charlie, Yindra, Nigel, and Maya sitting at this table. Mm. A couple things I want to say about this. I think, A, I'm sure all of them were like, great, Maya's sitting with us today. (laughs) Like, oh, great, our turn to be tortured. Um, Because I'm sure she's, like, dominating the conversation. But that's fine. I like that Maya has this kind of mentality of, like, I could sit wherever I want and grace people with my presence. And they're all like, yay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But yeah. um, And I I also get the impression that like after the previous week with Wyatt being suspended, she's almost like, yeah, like I'm friends with everyone. Like I wouldn't associate myself with like anyone who like was suspended last week. Like I'm just like, I have like a lot of friends. That's a good point. That's really interesting. Um, And then, yeah, I wanted to say too that I think it's really so far in season one, like, Charlie has sat with the True Star Squad, which is Zay and Nidra and Nigel, quite a bit, actually. Like, he mm. tends to be at that table. And I think that that's kind of interesting because we do know that he does have, like, a, a chill friendship with Yindra and Nigel, you know, especially like, going into season three when it's he's no longer there, but they still think of him as, like, a pal, you know? Like, they're not super close, yeah. but he clearly, I mean, we're seeing he sat with them a lot. And so I was just thinking about that. And I was like, I I feel like they must have been so confused in, like, season two when Charlie just disappeared. Like, they're like, why yeah. isn't he, where did he go? Like, what, does he not want to hang out with us anymore? And Zay in his head is like, no, it's because we're, like, making out and he doesn't want you to know that we have tension. Yeah, I feel like on first read, like, when this came out originally, I didn't feel like Charlie was, like, in a group mm-hmm. with them at all. No, yeah, yeah. But actually, he... He was, like, a pal of theirs, and, yeah, I mean, it's no wonder that Yindra and Nigel are just, like, so done with everyone. They're, like, so in freshman year, they ditched us, and then whatever <laughs> happened in junior year, Charlie went super weird, and then he literally just left the school for, like, no reason. Yeah. <laughs> they're, like, could someone and then just they give us out, the clue? Like, like, what the hell is going on? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they're probably so confused, too, because they're, like, you know, like, at the end of season one, like, Zay and Charlie, like, 
really good friends. Like, they're friends. Like, they're really, yeah. really close. And then season two, he just, they're still, they know they're still friends because Zay is like, Charlie is one of my best friends. So they know that, but he's just not there anymore. So they're like, how is he your best friend? But we never see him. Like, he doesn't sit with us half the time. Like, he avoids all of us, including you. What does that mean? And then Charlie leaves. And so they're like, and now they're fighting. And he's, they're like, what? What happened? What is going on behind the scenes that we're missing so much, as we know? <laughs> Just, and then, yeah, they find out. They finally get the context. And also makes a lot more sense, like, looking at this when in season three, spoiler alert, I suppose, mm-hmm. um, when Nigel is like, I found out first. Like, I was, <laughs> like, there. And, like, kind of brags to Yindra yeah. that he was there when Charlie came out to the group. It yeah. almost feels like, okay, that actually is kind of a brag, though, Nigel, because you guys were, like, supposed to be, like, all friends. And then... <laughs> the fact that he's just, like, there, but, like, no one else. But, I mean, look, that was Yindra's fault, though, because Yindra was, like, fighting with Zay, and that's the reason she exactly. wasn't there. <laughs> wow. We love, like, a social dynamic. It's Yeah. Amazing. these they, They're definitely, uh, they be having dynamics. That is for sure. We love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so then, you know, they're talking, this group is talking about their plans. Like, what did they do yesterday? What are they doing this weekend? You know, social plans. Uh, and Ooh. Maya, I'm sure, is just being annoying. But it's interesting <laughs> that, you know, they have this moment where they turn to say and they kind of ask him that question. And he's like, oh, haha, like kind of brushes it off, like doesn't really answer it. And they come back with like, oh, like, of course, like Zay's so popular. Of course he has plans. I think it's interesting because I think this ties back again into Mm. Yindra and Nigel picking on Zay here because of the whole like Brooklyn freshman year thing because they already went through a phase of like Zay ditched us to go hang out with other people. So I feel like that's kind of where this joking is coming from is like, oh, of course, like Zay, you're so popular. Um, And he's like, Zay never has time to hang out with us. And it's like, it's kind of a joke, but it's also like not. I'm yeah <laughs> and but it's like the he they don't even realize like it's like not even that it's that say is like no one wants to hang out with him because they all think he's so busy and popular Aww. but i wanted to say here i didn't because i never give justice to anything in the first few episodes of this show um i wanted to say i think it's very important that charlie is there because mm-hmm. it doesn't say this but i'm sure as we'll get into later in the episode I am sure he noticed that. Like, he had that moment where he was like, Zay mm-hmm. didn't really... I want to... I'm invested. I want to know what Zay's doing this weekend. Because I because I don't yeah, care, but like, I care. He was ready. <laughs> yeah. He was like, I'm, like, casually getting to know what Zay's up to. Amazing. Yeah. And, and then, then it, he doesn't get to know. Exactly. Like, so I think he, like, definitely... He definitely noticed. And I think if I were to rewrite this, or if we were actually, God bless, able to be watching this show, I think there would be, like, a reaction shot there. Like, we would see Charlie, mm. whether it's in the, you know, the side of the Yindra and Nigel shot, I think we would see his expression there. And I think that that would tell mm-hmm. us a lot without yeah. saying too much. What kind of, what expression would it be? Like, what do you see it as? I think I just think, like, it kind of this mirror to a lot of the ways that Zay was looking at Charlie in the last episode, where he was like, bro, mm-hmm. like, you're not chill about that. You're being way too chill about this. You know, like, that whole thing of, like, you're seeing right through me and it's making me uncomfortable. I think Mm -hmm. it would be the kind of flip side of that where it's like just thoughtful like Charlie looking Mm -hmm. at Zay and be like he didn't answer like that's weird like hmm but you know in a very like thoughtful Charlie way you know he's he's a very obviously we can't see this but I'm gonna say it anyway um he's a very expressive character in the sense that a lot of Charlie's facial expressions are really subtle like he's not like the divas or even like Riley where like a lot of like their faces are very expressive and partially because they're performers so like they like put that out there um I think Charlie is very very expressive as well but his are so like subtle little changes or little reactions partially Mm -hmm. because he is so well rehearsed at like you know tamping down his reactions to things and like having to be chill and having to not show conceal don't feel but he there's just all these little little twitches and little ticks and stuff like that that I think give him away or like convey what he's really thinking or feeling and at times that's very humorous but I think also at times here it's like in this moment it's just a thoughtful thing it's like you can see him thinking and that's what I think we'd see in just like a three second reaction shot so yeah which we could see that I know 
Oops, anyway. one of many things. <laughs> So then we transition to Riley. Yes, Riley and Issa in the lunch courtyard. Hooray for the techie table in the lunch courtyard. It's here. We made it. Um, So they're hanging out because they're in the courtyard, partially because the weather is improving. We are moving through the school year, but also because they want to be out of the cafeteria where the events, capital E, of last episode occurred. And Mm. what they're discussing is, first of all, like, how you doing? Like, how's the vibe? And Issa's like, I just stop babying me. Like, I'm fine. Like, don't worry about me. And I think that there's a Mm. kind of interesting friction there in that I think all the techies, but especially Issa and Lucas, because they're so unused to being cared for both, you Mm. know, parent wise and also kind of relationship wise. Like they're all very, I think they get weird about when people are concerned about them. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think like Riley is probably just expressing a very normal amount of concern, like as a friend, but Issa gets very, defensive about that she's like just drop it i'm chill and Rao is like okay he's like <laughs> not a big deal so then yeah. if he says not going to talk about it riley switches conversation topics and she asks about lucas so she asks you know how is he handling the suspension how's he doing and isa says well we haven't talked much i don't really know and to riley she's like oh is that is everything okay like is he upset and she, Issa's like, no, yeah, like, we're fine. And there's this line here. Again, I highlighted it in pink for foreshadowing. Cool. Where it's it's just that when he's not around, like, right there in front of you, I don't know. He can be hard to get a hold of. And this oh. is such a huge character thing for Lucas. Is that when he goes off the grid, he's, like, off the fuck grid this is so characteristic for him and he does it as well in the summer special for season four you know that he basically was doing that the entire special that's why we didn't see that much of him is because he was doing that routine of being hard to get a hold of and not being around so it it is just so it is such a character thing for him and i you know i'll say it will continue to be this is not the end of that trend for him hopefully someday he'll confront that behavior but not right now. <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, there are, it's not great, but there are worse things he could do as yeah, well. Yeah, that's true. It's better so, to be well, disappearing and hard to get a hold of, but fine, versus disappearing and hard to get a hold of, and I broke my wrist from free climbing in the rain. <laughs> exactly. It's like, okay, like, not great, Lucas, but also, <laughs> as far as things go, having his like survival instinct to just be like to get away and have some alone time you know not the worst Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hopefully at least the the self-improvement that could occur is he does that but he tells like riley or dash or whoever yes i'm okay just need my time yes and that's fine and i think and i think we saw that you know a little bit in the summer special for Mm -hmm. season four you know he was at times thankfully being like hey like i'm here or I'm leaving or I'm going to be back this time or just being like, I'm alive, you know, (laughs) like letting certain people know. And that's good. I will, I will say, um, maybe he won't always be that way for certain situations, but let's Mm. just, let's take that and let's put it in our pocket and let's just hold on to it. (laughs) Okay. We need to get like, we we have like a, we're going to make like a little China cabinet and it's got our little menagerie and the menagerie is things we're putting in our pocket so mm-hmm. that's in our pocket. That's in our menagerie is Lucas being hard to get hold of. I love it. We'll make a little note. We can... Anyone who has questions about that <laughs> can feel free to talk to us. Yes, um, we can make the blog. I swear to God, the blog is coming. I'm literally in the process of getting it finished, but we can make some kind of like little, little visual where it's like, here's our menagerie. And as we add things to it, we can add details. <laughs> So, I love it. Yes. Anyway, I just wanted to say that that line is very important. So, there it is. So, then we go back to class and we learn what this great idea that Angela had is, which is that they're going to be doing only acoustic songs for this week to give the techies a break. So, it's going to be like <laughs> no flash and bang, no razzle dazzle, like very stripped down, like just do the music and sing the song. Which, to be honest, <laughs> I love the concept yeah. of that. Like, I think that that's a really cool idea for an episode. I like I like it. Um, I will say in terms of when we talk about music in this episode moving forward, I will talk a little bit about like what I think the pros and cons of that situation are for us as the writers. But just as mm-hmm. a whole, love the concept. I think it's very fun. 
And honestly, like Fockle is like, this is an outrage. And like Maya's like, this, I can't believe this. But it's like, if anyone was going to give them some real talk, it would be like, well, you know that like in a show, which you want to one day be in, there's going to be like the slow, like <laughs> mournful ballad right. at the like upsetting part of it. And you're going to have to just stand in like one spotlight and sing the song. Right. And you'll probably be in rags if it's cinderella or like you know <laughs> which maya like, already whatever. did <laughs> she was exactly. already cinderella yeah no that's a great point and we can that kind of actually just jumps ahead to something i wanted to talk about which is so farkle in this episode you talking about that made me think about just that idea like farkle does that later in the show he does songs like mm. that so mm-hmm. well i mean like i miss the mm-hmm. music being alive santa fe like these are songs that mm. are just raw and emotional and stripped down and it's not necessarily about the big you know musical swell it's really about the emotion of the performance and Mm -hmm. Farkle does that so well but I think here what's so interesting about him in this episode that this is kind of the first episode where we're really starting to get even just a little glimpse of him as a full-fleshed character because in the past five episodes Mm -hmm. you know we've talked about like he's not even really there half the time like he's this caricature of this diva Mm -hmm. But this is where I think his struggle here is showing that. Where, like, he cannot get this damn assignment. He can't figure it out. He keeps bringing in all these concepts that are too flashy and too all over the place. And I think that what that is showing is that he, kind of like some of the other characters in this first season, the the diva thing is a defense mechanism. And it's a, like, yeah. everyone knows I'm brilliant because I'm so flashy. But he is so terrified of, like, being vulnerable Or, like, Mm -hmm. people seeing all of his fucked up stuff he has going on in his head. And it talks about at the end of the episode, he talks about, like, I have to be this way to get noticed because I'm in a family with five siblings and I, two very busy parents. And, like, if I'm not loud and I'm not flashy, no one cares, you know? And I think he's Mm -hmm. internalized that so much that here in this episode, we're seeing him struggle with, like, the even idea of showing that to other people. But as we come to learn, like, that is... I would say, like, his strength as a performer is that he is so good at conveying emotion through his music, partially because he loves music, but also because, just to be honest, you know, not to toot his horn, but, like, he is an amazing performer. So I think that this is such an interesting first glimpse into that. And that's why he has a line in the synopsis, is because that's, like, this first little chink in the armor that we're getting. Yeah, it's it's like a coping mechanism. It's almost like... um when people make jokes Mm -hmm. to which he also does later (laughs) yeah exactly it's like that but it's also this yeah this flashy like i'm so big and i'm so strong and Mm -hmm. no one can touch me yeah yeah um but speaking of his indignation there's uh, i highlighted here just an exchange of lines that i really love which is where they're like oh my god this is awful why are we doing this and Angela explains, like, well, the techies are short-staffed. And Farkle, in disbelief, is like, they're missing one person. And then Dave goes, it feels like more. <laughs> like, he, yes. it's such a great, like, I think both Farkle and Dave, their lines there are so character-specific. Like, yes. Farkle being like, this is insanely ridiculous that we're putting everything on hold because that jackass isn't here and can't they just pull together because again he also just has no concept of how hard it is to be a techie like to him it's like just do your job um but you know to Dave, to dave because he loves lucas but also to all of them it's like what feels like more because we have to do all the shit that you guys don't have to do yeah well i think it really is it really speaks to the difference between the divas and the not even just the divas but performers and techies is that performers it's in something they learn over time, I think, like coming into senior year and the showcase and things. It's like in this in this time, they're all about like performance as like an individual and like mm-hmm. that kind of individualist mindset. Whereas the techies are already kind of in this mindset of like, we're a team. We all count. We all needed. Yes. And I think then, yeah, you come into senior year and they kind of finally learn as a class that they're like performing is actually teamwork as well. And mm-hmm. like we do need each other. Yes, and that's Beautiful. a huge theme of this episode, too, as, as we'll talk about, you know, is this idea of, you know, when you're stripping something down, like, doing it on your own, or, like, is it better mm-hmm. to share that with someone, the idea of, like, the power of a duet and stuff yeah. like that, so, 
yes, we'll talk more about that as it comes. But so they're complaining. They're like, this sucks. And then Zay is like, you are so ridiculous. Like, just sing, dumbass. Like, he's basically like, <laughs> you're so reliant on, which he's right. He's like, you're so reliant on this yeah. like shine that you don't even remember how to actually perform, which sucks to be you guys, you're losers. And Farkle's <laughs> like, oh, like, you're so much better. And Zay says, it's fine. I can show you the robes and parlays into this performance. And I want to say, first of all, confident Zay is iconic. He yes. is so cool. Um, amazing. And he makes the interesting choice of pointing to Charlie and inviting him up on the stage to help with his acoustic performance by playing piano. Um, yeah. First wanted to say, um, speaking, since I just said Zay being confident is so cool, I'm sure Charlie was sitting there being like, wow, Zay is so hot. And then he was like, hey, want to come yeah. help me? And Charlie's like, wait, what? <laughs> I was <What>? listening. <laughs> I got distracted. What was going on? Yeah, but like, then he's in, he's like, okay. <laughs> okay, yes. Like, he's on board. But also it's it's very, yeah, it's interesting because, again, it's one of those times where they're so obviously almost being, like, flirty. Mm -hmm. But Charlie's like, oh, all good because his brain doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I even wrote, I said there's a lot – to unpack in this four seconds Zay Charlie moment yes, here. Exactly. Um, because I think, I mean, one for one, it just goes to show, you know, like Zay picking him, like there are definitely other people in this class that can play the piano, but mm -hmm. Zay picking him, A, he knows he's talented. He knows Charlie is very capable and he's very aware of that. And I think also it goes to show like, yes, people can do different things and play different instruments and stuff in this class, but Charlie Charlie has played piano and it shows that Zay has paid attention when Charlie mm -hmm. has performed before because he knows he's good enough to keep up with him. And then, I mean, that line of, you know, you'll keep up, I think is oh. a, so good. But it's also just like so, 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 so like key to like their whole relationship. Like it's kind of like mm. a motif in their relationship, both in a positive way in the sense of like, they're the only two that can match each other for dance at Adams and, you know, like mm. that whole connection that they share. But also it has this kind of dark side to it as well, where, you know, like emotionally and personally there's, you know, their whole storyline kind of throughout is this thing of catching up to each other. Like yes. when, spoilers, when they break up in season two, you know, Charlie says like, I'm not there where I need to be yet for this to be good. And that's why I have to like, you know, in theory, let you go. And and he says, like, and if I catch up, then we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But it's that idea of, like, right mm -hmm. now, Zay's saying, like, oh, you'll keep up. And it's like, well, will he? <laughs> you know? Will, he? will you? <laughs> yeah. And that's, and yeah. And it's, like, it's this whole constant back and forth for them. So I think that that's so good. Um, I love yeah, them. Amazing. And also, like, with that moment, I'm sure, like, Charlie must have felt so special you know like that zay chose yes. him and saw him he's like this is the popular guy who i have a crush on and he picked me okay i mean <laughs> look at me go but also like don't look at me look at him yeah 100 percent. yeah, yeah. It's, it's so good wow <sighs> them so then that goes into their performance their little duet here which it is a duet i want to say because the idea of having someone accompany you, it's like, yes, there is a Maya Hart version of it where it's like the music is just the music and you're the star. But here, the way that they're doing it, and I think the way that Zay and Charlie kind of do everything, is they're matching each other. Like, they're keeping up with each other. They're fitting each other's flow. And mm -hmm. it's it's actually not easy to do that, you know, to kind of just – this is, like, improv. It's implied that it's improv. So to be able to, like, yeah. keep up with one another and, like – if you listen to the song which i think it's a nice cover of course i like the original better yeah. but we're going for acoustics so we had to find an acoustic version that worked and i mean i love the little piano flares that there are in this cover where like the piano will just like throw a couple little extra notes in there like do a little ditty mm. that like kind of accents it and i think the idea of charlie doing that both being comfortable enough to do that being talented enough to do that and to be able to do that without overshadowing zay where it instead compliments him. Like, this is a duet. It is not just Zay singing and Charlie helping him. It's them performing together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's, a, it's oh, 
So, like, is this is this the first time they perform together? I mean, they did School in Life in 103, and but that was just, like, the two of them. Like, this is the yeah. first time where it's, like, they're both front-facing performing something together. Yeah, and they honestly don't do that very often. No, like, they there's don't. not many times. They have a lot of songs, but they don't have many public songs. Yep. So it's quite momentous, really. It's like, mm-hmm. look at him looking up from the keys. Yes, all those times that uh, Charlie looks up and smiles at him while they're doing this. Yeah. Which Zay, they... that's, and the thing is, Zay can't see it because Zay is based in no. the audience. So it's just, it's just us seeing Charlie look at Zay while Zay can't look at him. So it's very, like, telling. It's kind of that same thing of, yeah. like, the the concept of, like, when you hug someone, like, you they can't see your reaction, they can't see your face. It's that same mm. kind of, like, vulnerable emotion where it's, like, we're getting this very intimate glimpse into Charlie just in those moments where he's smiling at him. Which is kind of funny because it's, like, Charlie, everybody else can still see you. But, again, like, they're all focused <laughs> on Zay. does not work. They're yeah. focused on Zay. So they're not focused on him, like doing his little love sick crush smiles while he's playing the piano. <laughs> yep. I mean, if anyone saw, they either know because Dasha probably did see and probably did know. Um, <laughs> they're like, um, that's gay. They're like, okay, <laughs> we see you. Okay. Dylan's but like, anyone hey, that's what I probably... look like when you sing. <laughs> Asher's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but the rest of them could just, in theory, be like, wow, like, this is nice. Like, Charlie never shows this true emotion like that's lovely for him he's i'm glad he's like made a friend and either like, that or they're like oh there's charlie like smiling again because he's always smiling because he's always happy and nice and Prince yeah. charming yeah maybe <laughs> but it's not the same it's different it's a real smile yeah um and i think it's also funny that um they're all like this is a very nice moment and then farkle's like fuck this <laughs> yeah he's like i don't like this at all i don't want it i hate it i'm an auntie take it away I but yeah i, I kind of wanted to say like with this song general disclaimer for songs throughout this episode where like the thing is like not all the covers i, mean, I think they're all fine um it's just an interesting mm-hmm. situation to be in in a you know making a fake show like this where it's like it would be so much better if we could hear the actual cast singing the actual acoustic covers and it's like we could have that flexibility to decide like how do we want to Mm. you know do this and i think it's just it's not how do i phrase this it's like it's not as good as it could be because it's not the actual thing from ambition this theoretical show you know it's instead we're stuck with what acoustics exist on the internet that we can pull in that sounds good enough but it's it's harder to just i think imagine it sometimes because it does sound not like what it would sound like in theory but also not like the song it originally was so i want to just kind of put that out there like the the songs in this episode that's kind of one of the reasons that i think this is not one of my favorite episodes is because the music feels almost like knockoff music because it's Mm -hmm. these covers but I think if we could actually hear the cast and it was the ambition arrangements, I think it would be cool. Yeah, because it like it would always be like that. Like every episode, yeah. it would be the ambition people and we'd be like, yes, we love him. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So yeah, that's that song. That's that performance. Lovely. Amazing. Nobody does it better than ZC. Then we go into this scene with Sean and Jack and they're discussing the confessions page and they're trying to figure out like narrow start and area down like who do we think it is and they come down to these this concept of we think our biggest suspects are Farkle, Maya, and Lucas. This what, is so funny. I say, like, what do we what? think about that? <laughs> I think Jack and Sean are dumb. Like what are they <laughs> on about? I think they're just going mm-hmm. off like Again, like, it's, it's, it says, you know, which is helpful that they're like, we don't understand this. Like, we don't know how to deal with it because it's social media and we didn't have this growing up. But I think it goes to show, like, they're thinking less about, like, the actual specifics of this situation and more just, like, who causes shit <laughs> at our mm. school. But then they, I mean, they very quickly, like, disprove all three of those things. So, you know. Yeah. Back to square one. <laughs> um, but I think Jack's reasoning for why he doesn't think it was Lucas I think is really interesting 
because it goes to show that he does have he is slowly getting like even just over the course of the last two and a half years like a better understanding of lucas as a person like even if he's a little menace he's like no this this kind of shit is too methodical Mm -hmm. for him like he lashes out he does stuff without thinking he's reckless but he Mm -hmm. would not do something that takes this much effort and this much like organization and this much secrecy and i think he's right about that he's doing some criminal minds (laughs) right there like his brain is working yeah but it's like it's true because if we look at the ways that lucas has lashed out like the biggest one of course being in season two when he destroys the set piece like that is exactly what jack is describing there of like it's reckless it's hot-headed it's an act of aggression and it's chosen in the moment and he just does it versus like i mean all this stuff that the aac is doing is so like just like you have to be so strategic about it and lucas yeah. is just not like he that. just wouldn't he just wouldn't be bothered yeah it's kind of like to if we're it. talking about the ways that as we will a lot i'm sure over the course of this show but the Lucas and the Charlie similarities. Here's another similarity is that they're stupid and their brains like yeah. don't think strategic. They're not strategic people. Like Lucas can be like sneaky and strategic when he needs to be if it benefits him. But generally, if they're just going off their base instincts, like neither of them are good at that. Yeah, like if Lucas needs to be sneaky for like survival or like, yeah, for being like... He actually kind of is using his brain because he can be quite smart. But it's not, yeah. His actions, like, against people are not sneaky. Yeah. Because that's not how, yeah, that's not what he knows to do. Yeah, and he and Charlie both just operate very much on their emotions. Even if they act like they don't have emotions. (laughs) But they do, (laughs) and they act on them, like, all the time. So, yeah, and then Jack, you know, he loves Lucas, but he won't admit it. Um, But he's like... (laughs) I, you know, I just really don't think it's him. And I think it's very interesting that, you know, we've seen Jack be like, bitch, I'm so over you, like, even already in this season. But mm. for him to be here, like, no, I really don't think it's him. Like, that goes to show, A, that Jack is an observant educator, but B, also that he just, he does understand Lucas more than it maybe seems like he does, or maybe Lucas thinks he does. Yeah. He is getting there. And I think he's just learning how to deal with that. Like, he's understanding now and he's learning how to like help lucas with that yeah so i I highlighted this line here in the description at the end of the scene it says that they're talking about the sean and angela and sean's like "Mm, angela and i are not gonna get back together and he says (laughs) part of the reason is because she's a star and he's a deadbeat and that's all there is to it yes it's like sad but um i also i highlighted it with uh foreshadowing because i think there's some really interesting parallelisms between Sean and Angela and Riley and Lucas. And I think Ooh. that I like, I don't like, let me just say, like, you don't, up front, I wouldn't like, say you encourage this. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling like you're saying this, but you're like, let's not all like get invested <laughs> in Joel and Angela. Okay? Right. Like, like I'm kind of nothing. saying like, I, like, I just want to put out there, like Riley and Lucas far superior, like in terms of like both the relationship and like, their narrative oomph but I do think that there is some parallelism here and I think it's mostly because I mean there are very obvious parallels between Sean and Lucas and I think that that's one reason that Sean understands him and like lets him kind of get away with shit because he he gets it like he's been there he's Mm -hmm. a fucking mess too but that I think that sentiment there of like she's a star he's a deadbeat and that's why it's not gonna work is like such a key thing in RL as well like that's the way that I think Lucas feels about him and Riley where he's like she is amazing and she is so talented and so brilliant and so Mm -hmm. lovely and I'm a mess like I'm a fuck up and I have no future and I think that that's something that he has to like tamp down a lot like he when they're in a relationship like when they're actually together like he has Mm -hmm. to not think about that because it always haunts him a little bit like knowing that Riley is so good and so amazing and he feels like he's gonna drag her down with him. And I think we see that in season two, especially because, I mean, there's whole things like, especially in 207, right? Like when they're going through all the future check-in, junior Mm -hmm. check-in. Lucas has that moment in there where he's like, 
I don't have a fucking future. Like, I don't want to do this assignment because I have no future. And in that same episode, when Riley tries to talk to him again, after they kind of sort of, like, were fine at the end of 206, like, he basically shuts it down and he's like, Riley, just don't talk to me. Like, just leave me alone. And to her, it's like, that woman is like, fuck, like, what did I do? But it's not about her. Like, it's about him. And Mm. he's like, if I encourage this and if I let her, you know, get roped into my bullshit, like, it's gonna fall apart and I'm gonna ruin her life so I think that that is very very like just that sentiment she's a star he's a deadbeat and that's why it's not gonna work is important I completely agree I think I mean I've read before I mean I'm not encouraging the man to be down on himself (laughs) but a man for a relationship to work it will help if the man believes that the woman is you know a goddess Mm -hmm. above him and worships the ground that she walks on um, a woman will be happier with a man who is technically like below her in social status because she won't feel like she has to try and achieve something which will actually make it healthier um That's really interesting yeah and when you think about it, it makes sense because so much of like life for women can be <laughs> yeah is trying to like attain this like standard that is actually just super arbitrary Mm -hmm. anyway i definitely agree lucas um he doesn't believe in himself but he believes in riley which is interesting because it shows that he can believe in someone like he's not completely apathetic Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. um yeah where like where does he doesn't see himself going anywhere yeah but at the same time he can visualize the future because he can see riley going somewhere so there's just like that really interesting like yeah yeah and there's an interesting yeah and there's something interesting (laughs) too of like this is like really getting like into like later stuff too like in later seasons we'll talk about this as well but this idea of like he can't visualize his own future he can visualize her future but then the question is can he visualize himself in her future yes exactly it's like well what if she has a future and you're there does that a thing? <laughs> I mean, because, that's what Riley would say. She's like, well, um, why don't you like fix your she, vision? <laughs> yes. If she gets what she wants and what she wants is for him to be there, then he has to adjust. Yep. And I think that that's, that is similar to Sean and Angela in a lot of ways because mm-hmm. he has gotten so used to just being like, well, here I am, and she's the opposite, and that's why they've been so up and down. But yeah. It's kind of it's kind of fun in a way because it is sort of like a little foreshadowing. It sure is, and that's why I highlighted it. <laughs> All right, so then we move into the scene with the Babineaux uh, at their house, and I just wanted to say Babineaux, my fave family. Um, I think that they are the well. There's like mm-hmm. families in the show that I love that I think are like so mm-hmm. interesting, or like so fun to unpack, or like have all these fun characters. The Babineaux are, like, the peak family. Like, they're, like, it's... First of all, I mean, it's, like, if you're talking stereotypical, it's, like, it's the nuclear family. Like, it's a mom and a dad and two kids. But they're, like, so healthy and, like, so supportive. But they're also not, like, unbelievably supportive. Where it's, like, they're on yeah. here for shit. Like, they're, like... They, you know, like, they say, like, mom's a hard ass. And, like, say you're being annoying. And, like, Jada, like, picks on him all the time. Like, they're very, I think, realistically supportive. Where it's also, like annoying like they're mean to each other but in like a family loving way um but that's why I just love them because I think that they're like so realistic but like healthily realistic (laughs) yeah it's like you you can see that they're healthy you can see that they have communication and are open and supportive you know Donna is supportive of Zay's sexuality of yeah of of their dreams Mm -hmm. um and they clearly talk about you know what Zay finds annoying at school because they reference um Fackel as <laughs> yes. the obnoxious Jewish one um yes and I think that's so interesting too that it's like I think one reason that they they as a family structure are so important in ambition is because they're kind of like the only one that exists for all of these other characters to be put up against you know like yeah was, at least in the main characters because I would say you know like the other like really good example of a family dynamic is the Orlandos with Dylan mm-hmm. and Randall and Grant but that as well, that's an unconventional family structure because it's the single dad with a mother who passed yeah. away and that's like its whole own situation. Um, yeah. But I would also say that like the gardeners are like 
they want to be like yes the family but they're like it's almost like um like stranger things like the upside down like they're like (laughs) yeah we're the family but they're like the opposite actually yeah no and i think that that's Again, not to talk about ZC, but we talk about ZC all the time, so whatever. Um, I mean, like, that is so, 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 so true. And that is, like, such a big part of when I was saying, you know, like, comparing other families to them. Like, that's partially, like, the mink guy and, like, how, like, they are a big family and they have the structure of the mom and the dad and all that. But, like, they have their own fucked up issues. But Mm. the gardeners, like, that's so true because it seems like they are the perfect family and that's what Eleanor thinks they are and wants them to be mm-hmm. is like the truly perfect family with these perfect children and the perfect son and the perfect marriage and she already had that fucked up because Bridget fucked it up and what did she do she kicked her out because she was like you don't fit the perfect family anymore because you yeah. fucked up and that's fucked up first of all and you can see you can see that in this little scene here you can you can see that the interaction between the parents and the children in the Babinos is like, that would never happen. Right. Like it would so be like if, if Zay came and had messed quote unquote messed up. Cause like, listen, having sex in college is like not messing up. But if, if you messed up quote unquote in some way, like, yes, Zay knows like he could go to his parents and be like, I messed up. I don't know what to do. And they would help him and support mm-hmm. him. Even if, even if they were disappointed or upset. And that is, as we know, like there's so not the case in the Babin and the gardener family. And that's Mm -hmm. one of Charlie's biggest problems is that he is constant. Like, we've talked about this a little bit, like you and I, but like, Eleanor truly like, doesn't even really know her son. Like she if she Mm -hmm. had to like, there's like in season two, like Lucas gives Valerie like this weird ass verbal test of like, do you know this about Issa? Do you know this about Issa? No, you don't. Because you're a sucky mom. Um, But Mm -hmm. you know, like if Eleanor had to do that same thing about Charlie, she would answer so confidently be like, I know my perfect son, like, here's all my answers. And they'd probably like all be wrong because she just doesn't even know him at all. And that's partially her fault because she's so willfully like, this is just how he is. And I know I'm right. She doesn't even try to like, am I wrong? You know, like she doesn't think about it that way. She just believes what she wants to believe. Yeah. But it's also Charlie's fault because Charlie has never been brave enough to try to break that perception of him. It's safer to be to let her believe what she wants to believe and then play to that when she he's around her. But as we know, like that has been to his extreme mental and emotional detriment. So Mm -hmm. I think you're exactly right. Like I think Charlie's exposure to the Babinos through his friendship and later relationship with Zay Mm -hmm. is so like crazy for him because it's like, Oh my gosh, like this is, this is a real like family. Like I love my family and I, I love my sisters and I love my mom and I love my dad, but we don't have what they have. Like, it's so, the contrast is so stark. So, in conclusion, Babino supremacy, I guess? Yes. Everyone <laughs> should model themselves after them. Yes. Um. So, yeah, they're talking about what Zay is complaining about, about feeling, like, kind of isolated and, like, he doesn't have any, he doesn't say I don't have any friends, but kind of what's going on. Um, that's not something you want to say is it you're like oh uh, <laughs> no like I guess people just like aren't really like hanging out but you don't want to be like I'm friendless especially because then it does open up a whole thing I feel like say is still holding that back a little bit yes um but so that's here- in like a very normal way yes not in like a really messy <laughs> yeah uh, like most other characters. But so they're talking about that and like, well, who can you hang out with? Like, what are the reasons that you're not connecting with people? And they just talk about like, well, maybe it's because like, you know, you're very comfortable with yourself and you're very open about things and maybe other people aren't. But Donna says like, I have a really hard time believing that at this art school that you're at, that like there aren't other queer bitches that you could be hanging out with. She doesn't say it like that, but that's what she's saying. That's what she's meaning. <laughs> and Zay has this line where he says, unfortunately, the one, so basically the other gay people, the ones that have deviated from the narrow path of sexuality are either taken or idiots or both. And I was like, damn, like if you're Dasher, <laughs> I'm so sorry to you. Like, wow, oh, he really right. just dragged them really hard. Yeah, but also it's like who else, I guess, like, yeah, who's openly gay? At this gay, point, they're all, like, them. we know, we know, but, like, at this point, it's very much, like, yeah, most people haven't actually, like, openly deviated yeah. from it, but most people are. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I just, 
it's really just like it's kind of funny too because as we know like Zay and Dylan and Asher kind of develop this very like kind of playfully I don't even know what the word is but like petty relationship with each yeah. other and I think that this is kind of like kind of. yeah and this is like clearly the beginning of that because he's like I mean I think we can we can probably openly admit that the one he's calling an idiot is Dylan um I think we can safely no. say that um but <laughs> I mean, because also, again, like, think about the fact that, like, we don't know that much about Dylan as a character as the audience at this point. Like, Zay yeah, is probably true. the we same Yeah, we probably way. would. Yeah. We would probably think the same way. We'd be like, you know what? Actually, <laughs> and that it's like, does seem quite yeah. idiotic. Yeah, and it's like, if you don't, especially because they're sophomores and they're 15, so everybody's being idiotic, so he's, like, doubly idiotic. Yes. But it's that thing of, like, if you don't, if you don't know someone, like, you're only seeing, like, the most out there part of themselves that they're showing you it's like that theme that Mm. runs all through season one and i'm sure that's the case here because it's like i think zay comes to appreciate dylan for the Mm. things that he provides and does in later seasons but right now like they don't interact like they're not friends they don't have a connecting friend like eventually they have riley right who is like both of their best friends and that kind of gives them a perception of each other but at this point it's just like yeah he's gay and he's dumb (laughs) and that's it (laughs) And as we know, like, Zay Zay can be a little judgmental, too. So I think, like, that is definitely him being judgmental here. And then Taken, obviously, is Asher being Taken with Dylan. So. Yeah. And you know what? I love that that he is judgmental. Like, some people really are. And I feel like it's very much, like, a real character trait of his. And I love that it is carried through. I think it shows, too, that, like, he's, like, Zay is so... Zay is genuinely nice and he's a genuinely good-hearted person who really does try to be like a good person but everybody has flaws and I think Zay's one of Zay's biggest flaws is that like he's a little bit of a bitch like he's a little bit judgmental and a little bit snarky um yeah like even with people that he loves like we've seen him like get on Charlie for stuff like he's he's very blunt and he's very like opinionated and he holds very Mm. strong opinions and he won't back off of those which is like the leo in him just saying so you know like i Mm -hmm. think it's nice that he does have those kind of flaws those personality flaws because if he didn't he would be like this perfect character and that would be boring so (laughs) yeah it's it's realistic and speaking of annoying people um that's yes jada brings up the obnoxious jewish boy who wears blazers all the time even on casual friday Shout out to the blazer. Long live season one. Um, and Zay is like disgusted by the potential of becoming friends with Farkle, which is funny just because as we know, like he will develop a friendship with Farkle. Um, that means something yeah. to both of them, even though they would, he would probably never admit it out loud, but he does care for him, but not right now. <laughs> Nick. And then there's another line here that um, Jada, Jada, however you pronounce her name is, we don't know, um, that she says <laughs> <laughs> where I highlighted it in pink because I think it is um, imminently relevant foreshadowing Ooh. where she says, don't worry, once you get to college, everyone is so concerned with labeling themselves and exploring their identities that you won't even be able to keep up with all the eligible men suddenly in your reach. Um, I'm not Ooh. saying all of that sentence is necessarily foreshadowing, but I think that this idea of once you get to college, everybody is re-identifying themselves is relevant. Yeah. So. I do also think that they should have a lot of eligible men in his reach. <laughs> and women, because he's bi. But. Yeah. So, yeah. That's. I just wanted to, to highlight that, because season four is coming. So, exciting. Yeah. Um, But then I highlighted some sections in this next description section that I think is really interesting. Um. That Zay kind of emphasizes that he's not he's not want for romance at this point. Like he's not really looking for love. He's looking mm. for friends. Like he wants like someone to connect with. And he feels like, you know, he's known as the most popular guy, but he shouldn't be like waiting for people to want to hang out with him. And I think that to me, I just love this idea of once again to talk about Zay and Charlie. I love this idea mm. of he really genuinely, they, both of them, I think, well, Charlie's a little different, but Zay was not looking for love when he became friends with Charlie. Like he was there, they really started as a friendship and it was like, oh my God, like someone who gets me, someone who's, who I never thought would get me, but does and understands things that I didn't realize 
anybody else could understand and who has the same interests as me, who has the same, some of the same opinions as me, but who can also like debate with me. Like it was started for Zay totally as just like a friendship that became a best friendship and then started to have these vibes. Whereas for Charlie, I mean, we know he has a crush on him, so it's a little bit different. But I think that what I love about that is is this concept, this kind of trope in a way of like, you're not looking for love, but you find it in the place you didn't expect it. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And that's like in this moment right here is like so clear about that. Like it's like Zay, Zay is not trying to find a boyfriend. He's trying to find a friend. And um, he gets both. And he deserves it. Yes. Yes, he does. Um, but yeah, I love that idea of him like opening his mind a little because I think that is quite an issue when you're 15. You're like, these are my friends. And then you're like, oh, wait, where are they? Where'd they go? And then you kind of do have to be like, oh, I should give more people a chance. Maybe let people in. And I think that's true mm. even for Charlie, you know, like he had kind of written Charlie off, not as a performer, but like as perfect Prince Charming. Like he's not going to want to hang out with me. Like he's perfect and churchly and you know like all these things and he'd written it off for that reason and then they had this kind of weird confidence bonding moment and he was like oh well maybe not and then charlie's like bye i'm not gonna talk to you because i'm terrified and he was like okay he's being weird again never mind so i think that exactly that like this idea of like i need to not be so judgmental and that idea of like opening up and Mm. giving other people potential is a great long-term thing as well but it is very relevant to zay and charlie as well because he would not yeah if he had not let down his guard a little bit and decided, like, let me see what's really up here, they would not be friends. <laughs> True. I also want to say that when Donna suggests to reach out of outside of AAA, mm-hmm. that's kind of interesting because Zay does go on to those of us who have read the entire thing. <laughs> um, he goes on to Cosal and he goes on to be in West Side Story and, mm-hmm. like – try out for things and like I feel like he has one of the most like outside triple a kind of yes. stories really like of anyone he's interacting the most yeah with I, he think he does people yeah definitely kind of learned that lesson and to great effect and I think that's really interesting too because I also feel like this idea of like hang out with people who are different than your career or like the thing that you're pursuing is honestly like Mm. it doesn't really work for Zay in this episode but it's such good advice because like for me like when I was in film school and like doing the screenwritery thing like it was so refreshing and like healthy for me like by the middle of my school career to like become a resident assistant and like meet this Mm -hmm. totally different group of people who had nothing to do with film and nothing to do with writing and it's just like you feel like you're able to kind of like be someone else and like be Mm -hmm. your full personality and the full depth of your interests because when you're in such a niche thing like an art it's like yeah that is so defined about your personality and I think that that's something that we're gonna see as well in season four is this idea of like Adams was this little nest for them you know it was like we're all little art freaks and like we love it <laughs> and that's great but then it's like when you go out in the real world it's like how do you if that's how you've been defining yourself for four years like how do you make friends with new people who aren't (laughs) all about that necessarily? And Mm -hmm. how do you like present yourself in a sense when you're no longer in that space where you established early on what you were like? So I think that that's going to be a little thread that like is a very interesting thought that gets expanded on later on. Hello listener, it's Maggie. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Ambition Unpacked. And this is the end of part one of this episode. Make sure to tune in next time, a couple weeks from now for part two. Have a great couple weeks. Uh, Season four is coming, so get excited. All right.